Hey guys, what's up? Aru. We finally beat Scarabot and took over control of Sumeru, uncovered Ruka Devara's insight and knowledge from the Ermin's Soul Tree, and Kusanali is finally taking responsibility as the Denjo Archon. But there's one small little itty bitty problem that everyone seems to have forgotten, and it's the Tori still being in Sumeru, and not absolutely committing arson simply because he has a hard on doing experiments. But the Tori burning the Ermin's Soul might actually be the right thing to do, and it might be what's supposed to happen all along. Long. This video is gonna go over the parable of the tree from the book Before the Sun and Moon, a short summary of relevant events in the book, a take on the possible parallels between the characters of said parable, and the importance of those characters, as well as what their presence mean for the story. Finally, some questions on what may or may not happen down the line, depending on a set of premeditated results. Now bear in mind, before I start rambling, this is only a theory. I don't want you guys saying that this is gospel or that it is actually going to happen, because theories are of course theories, and we now know that Hoyo can alter Ermansel's data for their lore conveniences. But for now, let's start the video. If you want to know how the entire story went, you can look at this ancient video I made long ago with a jank microphone. You can bear with it or watch someone else's video, I don't really mind. But I will link a new video here once I get the chance to remake it. For anyone who hasn't, don't worry, I'll still help you guys catch up on the more important parts of the book regarding this video. If you already know what I'm talking about and want to get straight to the beans, then you can skip to this timestamp here. So way back in 2.4, Hoyo released the ancient sunken city known as Enkanomiya. And within Enkanomiya hides the dark secret of how a single god ruled a unified civilization. The entire story of how the world and the ancient civilization was created along with its downfall and destruction was recorded in a book named Before the Sun and Moon. This single god was called the Primordial One and it created humanity and the world with the help of four shades of itself that the Primordial One created. Humanity would prosper in the world and get what they needed as long as they did not fall to quote-unquote temptation. This temptation used to be theorized as human ambition, as humans are rational beings and are prone to seeking more than what is already given to them. The other possible temptation which is related to human ambition was to find or uncover something we now know as forbidden knowledge. This is still a stretch because we don't really know what forbidden knowledge is and can only speculate from what we already know that it could be to ascend the mortal plane or in short to become a god. Enkanomiya prospered for an unnumbered amount of years until the funerary year where a second heavenly throne descended and fought with the primordial one. Which is interesting because the time the second one came, Enkanomiya was plunged below the surface, basically marking the year they were buried. After some time, the Enkanomians would later find a way out but were barred from leaving the underworld as well as assuming that the primordial one beat the second one and assuming that the primordial one was the one who placed the ban. Which popped two theories that one of them beat the other. Primordial One beat the second one and is now sitting on a dying throne or the second one beating the Primordial One as well as the Shades and usurping the throne without anyone's knowledge. Again, this will depend on what you perceive happened and might change how you see Teyvat, Celestia, and the Abyss currently. The rest of the book isn't part of this video except for the main discussion which is the Parable of the Tree. Now in the parable of the tree, we have four key characters. The king which was the incarnation of the primordial one, the gardener and the tree spirit which did not have any incarnations at all, and the priest who was an incarnation of Isara named Tokoyo Okami. The story goes that the king's pavilion was damaged and to repair it, the king needed to cut down the tree with the most spiritual energy. However, the gardener could not do it because the gardener was in love with the spirit of that tree. To help the gardener with their task, the the priest, which was the incarnation of Isaroth, told the gardener to cut the branches of the tree and then plant it in their backyard. So the gardener followed the priest, cutting the branches first and then the tree entirely. The gardener was sad because it takes 500 years for a tree's spirit to grow. In response, the priest simply says, and I quote, Your one thought shall echo through eternity. Which is interesting since the term 500 years and the cataclysm is a key point and possibly the epicenter of all Genshin's lore. After which the gardener planted the branches of the tree in their backyard and there grew a new tree spirit which became the continuation of the previous tree. If you played 3.2 and know about some of Dane's Deep's theories, then maybe you could piece this together. Here is where we can start to take parallels of one story to the current story we have in our world. 
In the parable, a tree spirit takes 500 years to grow, and it took 500 years for Nahida to understand and finally take responsibility as the Dendro Archon and properly use the Ermin Soul Tree. With the Traveler's help, she ultimately was enlightened and was open to the proper insight she needed, finding clues and confronting her past self, Ruka Devada. At this point, Nahida is now able to retain the wisdom that Ruka Devada still has along with releasing the dreams of the people of Sumeru and finally be able to use the Urban Soul Tree properly. But now that Nahida has become the proper Dendro Archon she needs to be, it came at the cost of forgetting who Ruka Devara was, which isn't really a problem because the memories of everyone, even Kusanali herself, were altered to fit Kusanali's perspective and not Ruka Devara's, in which Kusanali's grasp of knowledge grew exponentially after playing her story quest, symbolizing what Ruka Devara meant when she said that Kusanali had a different fate from her own. Along with that, a new branch from the Ermin Soul Tree is now in our possession, the Silver Twig. Remember this twig because we'll go back to it after mentioning the king and his pavilion. So following the parable of the tree, there's one thing that hasn't been done yet, and that's to cut down the spirit tree, which I assume is the Ermin Soul Tree. Not the Ermin Soul Tree here, but the one at the center of the world. There's a line in 3.2 that's been sticking to me, and it's Ruka Devara mentioning that the Ermin Soul we see, as well as herself, is only a realm of consciousness. Basically a domain. Kusanali even states that the consciousness we entered was Ruka Devara's remaining consciousness and not the Ermin Soul itself. So this Ermin Soul isn't real and we aren't at the center of the world either. We were basically dreaming using Ruka Devara's realm and we're not at all teleported to the real Ermin Soul. So technically we don't know what the center of the world looks like or if Ermin Soul is still there. Here's a few lines of what Ruka Devara says about continuation of life, samsaras, dying trees, and and branches in her realm of consciousness. Ermin's soul and the surrounding lands have been reproduced here as they were years ago. But this is just a realm of consciousness. We are manifestations of the same nature. Hence why we would appear exactly the same. The new samsara? As Greater Lord Rukadevata, I'm the avatar of Ermin's soul. And you are the purest branch snapped from Ermansoul. Imagine it this way. Even if a tree dies, its branches will eventually take root and grow, continuing the tree's life in another form. I'm merely the remaining consciousness of Greater Lord Rukadevata. The real me has presumably died a long time ago. Hmm. Judging from your appearance, I've probably been dead for 500 years. But you're finally here, my new self in the samsara. Ruka Devara says that she is the avatar of Ermansol, the manifestation of a deity or the bodily form of a soul, a tree's spirit. And she also mentions that if a tree dies, the branches will take root and grow into a new tree. Ruka Devara even says that everything there is just a reproduced version and that she'd been dead for 500 years. Everything there is only what was left of her consciousness before she died. So that's not what Urban Soul looks like right now. Taking this into account, cutting down the Urban Soul, as crazy as it is, wouldn't be a bad idea, as long as we keep the purest branch of the tree and plant it somewhere else to let it grow. Which is what is happening right now. I don't just want to justify the Tore doing this, but I'd like to follow the demand of the king, which is the primordial one's incarnation. Therefore, the demands of the heavenly principle. Theoretically, remember, we're only drawing parallels and this may not be real. It's also important to remember that the king needed to repair their pavilion. And and this pavilion or mansion possibly being Celestia. Now regardless of who won in the second heavenly war, the second one or the primordial one, Celestia will still be empty after that war. And whoever is in control of that seat now needs to repair the damages done to it prior. And to repair that pavilion, the king still needs to cut down the tree with the most spiritual energy, which mirrors the urban soul tree being the center of the world and where all leyline energy comes from. But doing this poses another set of questions. First of all, who will cut the tree down? And if you don't mind me asking, is the previous urban soul tree still even standing? I mean, who's to say that the tree wasn't already cut down before 500 years ago? Rukodivara says that the realm of consciousness reproduced what urban 
Provencal and the surrounding lands look like as they were years before. Because remember, we don't know what's down there or if there's still anything worth of interest. But this next segment might give you a bit of insight on what might or might not be there. Remember this silver twig? Yeah, I told you we'd be back. So the silver twig's description about wisdom is where I want you guys to first focus on. A sage hanging from a tree upside down acquired the knowledge of how to inscribe runes and sacred words, along with a kingdom that was established on the tree's roots, finding the secrets of the cosmos. From that passage, it seems like there was a kingdom standing on the Ermansol tree's roots itself. From what I can tell, Ermansol is at the center of the world. So what kingdom could be established on its roots. Well, my only guess is Conria, since Conria is the only kingdom that does not live on the surface and is what we previously theorized as the kingdom tearing the veil of sin, which possibly is the secret of the cosmos or the stars. Ruins and sacred words are also something that the Abyss Order likes to do with their spells. Examples can range from the simplest Abyss Mage all the way to the Abyss Heralds and Lectors. Finally, the sage hanging from the tree could also be the same sage that Piero was trying to warn based on the description in the Mocking Mask. So basically, Conria is sitting on top of the Erminsol tree's roots and the Ermin Soul is located all the way down in the Abyss. Tangent. What confuses me is this passage here, saying that the branch would grow in a place with sunshine and rain. Considering it's the center of the world and it's where the branch was taken from, I don't think there's sunshine and rain underneath the world at all. So what I'm thinking is this new branch from the center of the world would only be planted on the surface where there is sunshine and rain. Meaning that Ermansol was at the same place Conria is and that the new branch from Ermansol was brought to the surface. Since the Dendro Archon has close ties with Ermansol, being named Boer and almost having close relations to the spider that is guarding Ermansol, you might think now that Sumeru and Conria would have close ties as well. Consider Halfdan's clothes look pretty similar to Sumeru, and both of them are looking to level the gods. But as of now, we don't really have any info on what Sumeru says about Conria. Only that when the seven were brought to Conria, Ruka Devata wasn't included. She was supposed to protect Ermansol, which is also possibly located in Conria. Considering there are only seven elements, why is Dendro not part of the seven when they were called to Conria? The only answer I have to this confusion in my head is that Ermansol's data was changed when the cataclysm happened. It's also interesting why we didn't ask about Conria and its whereabouts today, nor did Nahida try to give info about Conria from Ermansol. I mean, you would assume that Ermansol has info on Conria right now, or at least the proper history. This could fit why our sibling has expunged data from Ermansol and why we are descendants and not the other. It also answers the question of who the third descender is, since we only know of the possible first, second, and the fourth, with the gap of info being from the third and the little info we have from the cataclysm possibly fitting together. End of tangent. Now, regarding the gardener, we have two possible answers. That being, in the next patch, the Tori comes in and burns Ermansol for whatever reason that the Fatui has. Maybe Piero also knows about the parable of the tree. Regardless, will comply with our need to follow the king's orders. But does burning urban soul give the same result as cutting it down? If you think Dutori is our gardener, then maybe you would go back to Ruka Devara, saying that even if a tree dies, the branches will still grow and become the new urban soul tree. Hence the parallels between Ruka Devara and Kusanali being the old and new tree spirit. So burning or cutting doesn't really mean much as long as it's gone. But Dutori doesn't really care about neither the Dendro Archon nor Teyvat. From what I'm getting, he cares more about his experiments, which does not fit the gardener's description. And Piero wanting to burn the tree would basically be following the heavenly principles, which he does not want to do. Maybe he has another motive and plan for burning Ermansol that we don't know yet. Unless Piero is the gardener. It would make sense though since we theoretically assume that Ermansol is in Conria. Another possible gardener we have is officially named the Bow Keeper. Ainsleep is a character that is despised by the Abyss Order for being a traitor. Now, I don't really know how he is a traitor, but a running theory I have since 2.4 is that Dainsleaf is the one keeping Teyvat alive 
by holding the branches of Ermensel, hence his name. And after 3.2, this is still a crack theory by the way, what I think happened was that Dane's Thief cared enough for Teyvat and wanted to save it. So he was advised by Easteroth to cut the branches from Ermensel, which could have made Dane's Leaf warn Ruka Devara and was able to cut the purest branch from Ermensel before sacrificing herself to save it, resulting in Kusanali after 500 years. Remember, based on the silver twig, Anria could be in the same place that the Ermensel tree is. This could mean that Dane's Leaf knows Easteroth in some way or was at least guided by Easteroth without Dane's Leaf knowing. That could explain why Dane's Leaf is hiding so much and says so little to us. It's also weird that Dane's Leaf isn't in Sumeru after Scaramouche almost ascended to godhood and tried to make his way to the stars. Unless that's not what Scaramouche wants. Maybe Scaramouche only wants to be a god and not go to the stars. Now I want you guys to take a listen on Dane's Leaf prophesying that those who dream of dreaming are somewhat a crucial piece in his narrative while transitioning to the stars in travail. I know he's talking about Conria but think about it from the perspective of anyone outside or inside Teyvat who has an inkling of knowledge about the stars and is aware of humanity's potential. But in the hidden corners where the god's gaze does not fall, there are those who dream of dreaming. Some say a few are chosen and the rest are dregs. But I say we humans have our humanity. We will defy this world with a power from beyond. So with that said, Dane's Leaf could already be enlightened by the truth or forbidden knowledge of the world and is aware of how far human ambition can take someone as well as the possibility of being told by Easteroth on what to do. So maybe he warned the Seven Nations and allowed Ruka Devara to act right before the Cataclysm as well as before the second pollution of forbidden knowledge happened. Because remember, there were two incidents of forbidden knowledge. One from thousands of years ago with King Deshret and the second one happening the same time as the Cataclysm. Going with Dane's leaf side, however, opens the question of what Dottori is burning in Winter Night's Lazo. It's possible that this is the real Ermensol but doesn't have the same tree spirit, since Ruka Devara already passed down her insight to Kusanali and that a new Ermensol, the Silver Twig, is possibly already growing on the surface. For one, Dottori's experiments don't end with Scaramouche. That's just one of his experiments or one of his segments. Theoretically speaking, he could still have seven more experiments if we count every segment in his head. But now that those segments are gone, what do you think his one most important experiment will be? The Dottori in his prime is in Sumeru, as mentioned in Winter Night's Lazo, and the Dottori in his prime is the one burning this huge tree. You can even see the older Dottori speaking the same lines as the younger one here. Where's the segment in the prime of his life then? <laughs> He's busy with a little experiment in blasphemy. <gasps> this scene, however, has not been done in game yet. And at the same time, we haven't cut down the spirit tree with the most spiritual energy. Not to mention, the Tori has the power of a god as well as having two gnosis with him. All he needs now is to find a way to Erminsel and do the same thing that he did in Winter Night's Lazo. So when is this coming? No one has said anything about it yet. Even Nahida skips to our new journey to Fontaine and not really elaborate or at least theorize on what Dottori might do with the two Gnosis. Only that he ran off with both of them in exchange for his segments and knowledge of the sky. So is destroying the real Ermin soul, if it's still down there, the one experiment that the Tori hasn't done yet? Is the parable of the tree all a prophecy made to happen? And more importantly, if we are going to burn the tree, what's gonna happen if we do exactly that? Will it unleash the heavenly principles? destroy all the data that was put into Ermensol, essentially restarting the system, or will the so-called pavilion in the sky be whole again, and the god sitting on the heavenly throne whoever it is, will now have full power. These questions are gonna be for another video tackling the old world, the heavenly principles, and the meaning of forbidden knowledge. For now, we can assume that a new Ermensol tree has been planted and the old Ermensol tree has served its final purpose. So we'll leave whatever happens after to the next patch. 
And there you have it, my thoughts regarding the Ermin Soul's fate and the parable of the tree, as well as what might happen in the later patches. If you have a similar thought or have a different perspective, comment below and show your opinions. It's been another hot minute since my new upload, and I really enjoyed putting this video together, so I hope you guys enjoyed it too. I really loved the way they ended 3.2 on a bittersweet note, as well as propping up another antagonist right away for us to wonder what they're up to. Especially Especially since Dottore is our new enemy now that we're done with Scaramouche and that Dottore still has another experiment that he has to finish. Finally, the new information that we have regarding the fourth descender and whoever the first until the third is. Which really brings up the little lore that we have about the old world. I'm guessing we'll find more info about the old world once we go through the next patches and especially once we end up in Fontaine. But if you do enjoy this video, make sure you leave a like, comment below what you guys think, and if you want to see more of my content, do subscribe and click on that bell icon to stay up to date whenever I have a new video or stream. If you want to support your boy, go give my Twitter a follow. I'm picking up on posts slowly, but yeah, do follow my Twitter if you so please. With that said, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!